recording is on and uh, wish everybody a good morning, good afternoon or good night around the world. Uh, this is a special edition for GSOC uh, office hour where we will uh, answer questions, solve doubts about two uh, project ideas uh, for the Jenkins Google Summer of Code. Um, and we have several mentors here on the, on the call. So just a brief presentation for myself. I'm John Mark Mason. I'm located in Brussels, Belgium, Europe. And uh, together with Alyssa, who is on the West Coast, the United States were both org admins. And we have also Bruno, Bruno Vrachten, who is located in northern of France. So these are the organizers. And we have um, mentors around the table. So we walk first. Basil, can you just present yourself who you are, where you're located? Sure, I'm Basil, and uh, I'm located in Northern California. Okay, Mark. I'm I'm Mark, and I'm located in Colorado, in the United States, not far from the Rocky Mountains. Great. So, morning for you too. And Logi, where are who are you? Where are you located? Yeah. Hi, I'm Logi. I'm located in uh, Sri Lanka. Yeah. Well, I I. I I should remember it, yeah, each time. So, and how do you pronounce your first name, Logi? Logi, yeah. <laughs> okay, need a training for that. So, welcome. Um, so, without further delay, we're going to uh, discuss the first project idea, which has quite an impressive uh, a name. So, exponential back off and jitter uh, for agent. Uh, reconnections. Uh, I think this is a subject where Basil has good knowledge about. He proposed uh, this project idea. So first of all, could you present the project, what it is, why it's important, and then we'll open up for a question for housekeeping. Uh, the presentation of the project should not exceed 10 minutes. Sure, sure. Um, well, as the uh, as a user of the Swarm plugin, there's been multiple pull requests over the years to solve this problem, which is that when restarting a controller, uh, all of the agents reconnect at the same time. And this can be a scalability limitation if too many agents are connecting to the controller simultaneously, um, the controller could reject some of these connections. And essentially that means that the restart of the controller would, uh, would be only partially successful if, age, if some of the agents were not able to reconnect. Um, so people have uh, reported this with both the swarm uh, agents as well as the standard remoting agents. Uh, so Swarm is effectively a wrapper around remoting. And the uh, um, the problem is basically to, this is basically a scalability problem, right? Um, and the idea behind this solution would be um, to introduce jitter um, so that these agents aren't all trying to reconnect at the same time. Um, the main challenges for this project are, uh, number one, there's two different implementations of this. So the code is not already in a clean state. There's essentially the duplicate logic in the standard remoting framework as well as in Swarm. So, um, so that's already going to be a challenge. Then the other challenge with this uh, project is demonstrating that this jitter is actually having the desired effect um, on 
a busy controller. So, you know, it's one thing to implement an algorithm that's defined on paper, but the other question is, you know, is this actually beneficial to users? And the only way to really determine that is to do some kind of scalability testing and to see, okay, well, how can we reproduce this scenario where the controller is being overwhelmed with agent reconnections? And once we can reproduce that scenario, is this addition of jitter actually making a difference? That is, is it improving the success rate of reconnections? So that's really this project in a nutshell. So we we have already just for for my general culture. So uh, does the remoting uh, part have already uh, the um, uh, exponential backoff? That means that every time an additional time is added to the retry, does it already have that? I don't or... remember. I think there's some there's definitely some stuff missing from remoting that is present in the swarm version and and vice versa maybe in other words these two implementations are not at feature parity with each other so okay that's part of this project is to get these two different implementations up to feature parity and i can't i can't remember what remoting is missing it's definitely missing something Mark uh, raised his hand. Yeah, Basil, could you could you describe for those who might not be familiar with what the term jitter means in this case? Give a, a little more a little more depth on it. I had to go do some some looking to see. Okay, what's jitter in this in the context, etc. Yeah, jitter in this context means adding a randomized time delay uh, to spread out uh, to spread out load. So. Um, in the project proposal, there's a link to an AWS blog post that has a nice diagram of this, um, which kind of shows that uh, adding jitter will kind of increase the, um, what's the best way to describe this? It'll, adding jitter will, uh, will ensure that there aren't these big columns of uh, dots in the same uh, time span, and if if you, uh, I mean, I just just go read the AWS blog post, but they have a diagram of this where they show how essentially adding jitter distributes the load in a different way, so that uh, so that the server isn't overwhelmed within any particular time period. Okay, so it's it's just jitter is a random random startup delay to the yeah. initial connection, and that that by doing randomness when a thousand things connect, we don't get a thousand of them in the same exact second. Right. The idea is spread it around. Okay, thank you. Thanks for but the with, clarification. With, sorry, the, I should have read the paper. No, it's all right. It's spreading it around within a limited boundary. Okay. With a limited or unlimited? Limited. A limited boundary. Right, okay. say between so and so many seconds, choose right. where you're going to start. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Retrying and, is a retrying is a deceivingly complex topic um, because if you if you look at um, there's like a one of my favorite libraries for retrying is Tenacity, which is a Python library, and they have a really good documentation. But um, if you look at the Tenacity documentation, you can see that there's all these different ways that you can retry things, and there's not some of them are better in some use cases than others, but it's not obvious to anyone who's who's new to, to retrying that there's this much complexity behind the topic. For, you know, for example, you can uh, you can sleep fixed amount of time between tries. You can uh, you can increase the amount of sleeping between retries, which is um, called exponential backoff, which is done by TCP. You can add jitter. You can, there's all these things that you can do, and they make sense in some use cases, but not others. So the use case that we're talking about is the thundering herd problem. And so that that, that is the case that we're discussing with con controllers being flooded with agent reconnections. And uh, in, in that use case, the identified solution kind of industry-wide is to use exponential backoff and jitter. So that, that's, that's the medicine for this problem. That's a medicine. Um... 
I, I think one of the important dimension about that is uh, to demonstrate that it has the desired effect. So the, the, the testing, so there are the usual testing, which is unit test, integration testing, but here we really need to do an end-to-end -end test of that feature. Yeah, the, the testing is probably the hardest part of this actually, because I mean, it's, it's relatively straightforward to refactor duplicate code and to add a loop that goes and, you know, it's, it's maybe not trivial, but uh, you know, it's something that's relative. Conceptually, it's not, uh, there's nothing complicated about adding a, a for loop, you know, to some code. Um, in, in practice, it's going to be hard because this code is a mess and it's, it's extremely <laughs> messy code. So, and then, like I said, there's two versions of it as well. So if, in practice, it's like one of the most difficult for loops that you're, that you're going to be adding, but, uh, but you know, the, the testing is really the, the hard part here because uh, how do you really uh, demonstrate that this is making a difference? Um, you know, uh, the, there's, it's, it's not easy to set up these kind of scalability environments, even if you have a lot of computers, but especially if you don't have a lot of computers, um, you know, if you're dealing with uh, a small number of machines, maybe even one machine, um, you know, it would be be fairly challenging to kind of replicate this scalability limitation where you're seeing agents being dropped. Um, so that that that's maybe would... a, a difficult part of this, and I'm not that's sure a... what. Yeah, sorry. In your previous life, you experienced these herd effects. What were yeah, the, about I did. the I... sizes? That yeah, I was running a big Jenkins uh, deployment at a previous employer where I experienced this firsthand. And I've seen um, other users, on um, people have submitted the pull requests to Swarm to add Jitter. And, and uh, I've even seen uh, social media posts from uh, Jenkins users talking about this problem. So, you know, one idea might be to try to, you know, connect with one of these users and try to get them to deploy, you know, a, a test version or something like that. Oh, but yeah, you know, that, that isn't certain that we'd be able to find someone like that or that they'd be willing to, uh, to deploy to their production environment some of this code. <laughs> and, and what was the, the number of agents we were talking to, uh, about? Uh, are we talking about 10, 100, 1,000? Well, in my case, it was hundreds. Uh, I'm, not sure what, um, I'm not sure what the Netflix case is. I think it's hundreds to thousands. And there were also some people in the Swarm plugin filing pull requests, and I tried to ask them for more information, and I never got any. So, And excuse my curiosity, but and what is the, the, the effect of the herds? Uh, the yeah, uh, the effect is if an agent can't reconnect, then that job is still running on the agent, but the controller has lost communication. So uh, when the controller is re is coming back up after the restart, uh, you won't be able to get any status updates until it reconnects with the agent. So um, you know, for I think I'm not sure if remoting does retries at all right now, which is, I think, the scary part. I think remoting it by itself might might not be doing retries. I don't, I don't know. I don't really use remoting directly because I, li I like I like Swarm personally, but <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's not really the standard way of doing it. Swarm definitely does retrying, which is, you know, critical in this kind of scenario. Um, but then again, you know, if you're, if all the agents are retrying at the exact same time, then, that could create a worse problem, which is that the controller just gets completely hammered with connections at the same instant, you know, every 10 seconds or every 30 seconds, which is why that, which is why jitter and back off are both needed. Um, but yeah, basically the effect is that the, uh, that the controller could be made inaccessible if it's receiving so many requests at the same time or that jobs wouldn't show status updates until that reconnection takes place. Okay. Uh, last question before opening the questions. I'm keeping the clock in, in, in my eye. Uh, 
this project can be huge. So there, there's a lot of a lot of work possibilities. There are a lot of uh, uh, holes you can start uh, jumping, rabbit holes that you can go. Uh, can it be cut in in different phases or different and and say have ideas for another edition of Google Summer of Code or or is do you see a strategy like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's no harm at all in just simply consolidating the duplicate code that exists today and not including and not having any regressions, right? That is a change that could easily be accepted without controversy if the if the existing code is deduplicated into some sort just of common uh, function or common class or whatever. Um, the challenge there is uh, that a command line interface needs to be added to uh, express some of these ideas, right? To to express the the back off period or the uh, number, amount of time between tries, the number of tries, uh, et cetera. So, uh, and designing CLIs is always tricky because it's effectively a contract that you can't break once you once people start using these command line options. So, um, so a lot of effort needs to be. Even, in other words, there's this is challenge where even if you're only implementing a subset of this, you need to design the CLI for the whole thing before you can implement a small part of it because designing a CLI is one of those things where um, it, it's effectively an API that people commit to. So you can't, you can't just do it in incrementally. You've got to design the whole API, even if you're only implementing part of that API um, upfront. So I think that's, that's, that's the only, that's the biggest impediment to breaking this up into incremental tasks is that the, the CLI really needs to be thought out this one completely. Yeah. Um, before anything is implemented, uh, even if even if the implementation is only partial, it's easy it's easy to leave out CLI commands or subcommands, uh, but it's much harder after you've already implemented a CLI to go back and say, ah, well, you know, actually, this I need to rename this argument or mm -hmm. I need to add some some uh, mandatory flags to this other argument. You know, it's it's a lot harder to to do that. Um, there is also so, an other interesting work package is being the how to test it, and uh, there might be some thoughts, designing, and tooling. Here, I will stop this presentation part. I would just would like to give the word to uh, to Logi. Uh, if you have additional things you would like to share, or questions, or or points, don't forget to unmute you. Yeah, uh, so I would add upon that some uh, points. So this project is very vast. So uh, the remoting module is very intricate and there are a lot of dependencies on the plugin as well. So the, there will be very challenging tasks that when we try to uh, push these uh, code changes to this uh, upstream repository. So when it comes to uh, the production level of uh, this uh, uh, implementations, then we need a, a very hard testing for this. Uh, and uh, students can do their own research because this kind of, uh, like we can we can use the exponential for now, like that's a very uh, industrial standard for this uh, retry mechanism, even in my company XYZ. So I, we are using the exponential uh, retry for even for the microservice intercommunications. So uh, exponential and good, uh, 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 choice, but uh, students can do their research on the research, and they can propose uh, what what whatever it works. We can uh, uh, implement that. Yeah, but uh, it's a very uh, vast project, and uh, and also interesting project. So that's why I joined Samantha. Great. So yeah. to take and, the analogy uh, again, a big mountain. Mm -hmm. Okay, who wanted to jump in? Oh, okay. So it was an artifact from from my side. Open up the question to uh, the rest of the audience. Uh, Nethra, Vandit, or uh, hello, everybody. 
uh, I, I have some questions related to uh, how the unification of Jenkins uh, remoting and swamp plugin uh, is to be implemented. Like currently remoting waits for 10 seconds after every uh, re after every attempt to connect to the controller. Currently it waits for 10 seconds. Uh, so uh, and the swamp plugin has has a uh, linear linear back of linear retry algorithm and exponential back of exponential retry algorithm so do we have uh, and it all and swamp plugin already has the cli function uh, where we where we can uh, override the default exponential back of uh, algorithm so first do we have to uh, do we have to uh, implement the things that are already in swamp plugin into the remoting module and then unify it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, and the swarm CLI is missing jitter. Yeah, so yeah. It, all to, so altogether, the the first step would be to design. And I I would not consider the swarm CLI to be a work of art to be emulated. It's evolved haphazardly, and the standard for introducing a C CLI change to remoting is a lot higher than the standard for, or I'd say that, yeah, Swarm has just evolved in a very messy way over the years. But um, like the main, the main challenge is coming up with a good, a, a good CLI. And I actually wouldn't be afraid to break Swarm consumers because I don't think too many of them are using this. Or if, even if they are, it could be announced, you know, ahead of time. But the key is to design a CLI that does make sense and is easy to use. That includes all the features that Swarm has and Jitter, which Swarm does not yet have. And to really find a way to express that to the user, because I think right now in Swarm, the uh, exponential backup—it's a very strange CLI. It's—it's it's not an intuitive. Uh, way of expressing the arguments and the 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 intervals it's basically just there as a historical accident so th that's where i would start is uh really figuring out how do we express these options in an intuitive way and then from there how do we retrofit these existing implementations to align with that intuitive cli which would only exist in in theory and then in practice we can slowly evolve the existing implementations to fit it's going to be easier for remoting because there isn't any support for this so it's a clean slate but that's both good and bad in the sense that it only gives us one chance to get the cli right um and then for swarm there's a little bit of so you know with swarm if we need to change the cli to really fit this ideal then we could do something like have a, a transition period or something where these old options keep working, but we deprecate them and try to move to the, the options that we think make sense. So uh, designing a good CLI, designing a, uh, an intuitive CLI that can be used by a lot of people without making them think too hard about what options they need. I think that's a big part of this. Thank you, uh, Bensel. Are there other questions? Or... Yeah, yeah, I have some more questions. Sorry for taking so much time. Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, my question is about the stress te testing framework. Uh, I searched the web and I found about uh, Apache JMeter. Like, uh, we can use that to uh, mock something like that where uh, it, 10 or 20 agents we can we can mock 10 or 20 agents using that i i got i got to re read that from some blogs uh, on the web but it's not the uh, optimal solution but it's it's something that we can use to for stress testing on remoting and the cli part i th i think uh, because it is a one chance to create the cli if i if uh, right now i try to uh, use remoting from the cli it it says you are using it uh, from the console use it interactively so currently it has something like of a cli implemented but the it, it, but it does not work it just says use it interactively okay uh, so like uh, does the remoting already have it uh, because uh, the comp the code is uh, really complex just like you said 
that is something I got uh, from the high level overview. Okay. So, uh, uh, Vandit, did, did you have a, a specific question? So, I think you you raised a few points about uh, the the testing framework. So, you explored a few ideas. Yeah. Uh, Apache generator. And, and having read your your initial uh, uh, draft, so I think there is, is an interesting topic to, to research, although there's choices that will have to be made. Uh, uh, one of the things that you can start, and I'm, I'm talking to the whole audience here, is uh, to define, so to, to know how do we know that we have the problem. Right. So there's the first question and the first research item that can be part of GSOC. So you don't need to have it, but state the problem uh, there. So how can you say, there we, ha there we are, now we have the problem. And then the second part is to think on how can I increase the load or create a load where I can demonstrate that the problem is caused by this retry uh, load. And, and this would be already, I believe, uh, looking at, at Basel, uh, already one big step forward in starting to solve uh, the problem. And, and then uh, the, the other steps uh, are, are, so it, I, I think seeing from the reaction from Basel, I think I'm, I'm on, on solid ground there. Say. Now I need to, to look at the clock. Yeah, are there other be... questions? To Sorry, be accepted, to be accepted, ultimately, our bar for accept. Uh, well, by accepted, I don't mean uh, from a GSOC point of view, but for for any code change to remoting to be merged, our standard would our standard of uh, approval would be for it to be demonstrated to solve some sort of problem and to not cause regressions, and the demonst so the demonstration that it's solving some sort of problem would either come from the results of a stress test framework or from a, an end user who's experiencing the problem, trying out the build and reporting success. And that's a lot harder because end users are, they're not very good at trying out beta code wow. from us. And even if, even if they're willing to, they are not always they're not always good about reporting back the results or sometimes their results are questionable and you wonder if they really deployed it correctly, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're not the one doing the testing yourself, it's a lot harder to uh, convince yourself that the change has had the desired effect. It's a lot easier if you're also the one doing the testing. So, so that's why I'm really hesitant to rely on other community members to do testing because it's very hit or miss with them. Sometimes they're very responsive and test your build right away. And, and other times, other times it just hits a dead end. So right. it, yeah, I mean, first, first to, time. first to accept uh, PR to remoting, we'd want to see some evidence that it's having a beneficial effect and a real world use case, not just a, a not just a, a mock test. So um, wh whether that's sure. so whether that's a local test or an end user, like I said, um, we, we generally wouldn't accept a pull request unless we can we can tell that this is better than before and it's not causing a regression. Yeah. So I read from that that starting with test and, and digging into the test framework is a, a, a first good step for that project. Yeah, and uh, you know, like Logie mentioned, you know, maybe uh, Jitter isn't uh, the best solution to the problem, you know, or maybe there are other solutions that you could experiment with and choose uh, which one has the, the best effect if you've got a way to increase load like that, so. I, I like that. Uh, here, I'm, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll pause this discussion. Uh, We'll try to keep 10 minutes at the end. Uh, we'll not exceed the hour promised uh, because these are interesting questions and interesting discussions, but uh, I'll be, so we'll keep 10 minutes at the end for uh, questions. 
Uh, I'd like to cover the second uh, project. Um, so the GitLab plugin modernization. Um, I, I think Mark, you had things to tell us or, or Basil, who would mm -hmm. like to talk about that project? I, I, I think Basil's more credible. I'm happy to talk about it if you'd like. But Basel do you want to talk about it at a high? Do you want to introduce it at a high level, and then I can talk about some of the challenges Ooh. with Jersey and Rest Easy? Oh yes, Perfect. yes, yes. Oh, and th that's okay. Basel has just noted a, a sort of awkward mistake I made. So yes, let's ho highlight that first. So at the high level, the GitLab plugin is important to Jenkins consumers who are using GitLab as their SCM system. It, it allows them to do all sorts of interesting and useful things, updates of, of merge request comments, status changes, et cetera. And so the GitLab plugin is quite useful. However, the GitLab plugin is outdated in many of the things that it does and much of its implementation. And there are specific things that need to be improved in that implementation now, it's important that we have a strong integration with GitLab, just like we have a strong integration with GitHub and Bitbucket, SCM providers matter deeply to Jenkins users. So we want the GitLab plugin to be very strong. Uh, and right now it's, it's not had an active maintainer for a while. It's not had, it, Chris Stern just barely started on it again. And we're, we're deeply grateful for that, but there's a lot to be done to modernize this thing. Uh, I think that's all I wanted to say. Basil, do you want to take the next step, which is more sure. more relevant technical detail? Yeah, the, Git, the GitLab plugin is communicating with a given GitLab server through its REST API. So GitLab has a, a REST API. I think it's, um, I can't remember if it's JSON-based. I think it's JSON-based. Um, and essentially anything that's communicating with it um, goes through that API, including the GitLab Jenkins plugin. And we've had this fairly constant thorn in our side for the last few years that I've noticed, um, which is the way that the Jenkins GitLab plugin communicates through this REST API. It's using a very old library called REST Easy. And not only that, but it's also using a very old version of it. Yeah. Um, and this this library has been a bit of a challenge to maintain. It, it's as far as I know, it's the only thing in Jenkins land in the Jenkins ecosystem that is using this particular REST Easy library. And this library is not very easy to work with, but um, it's also just very fragile. And there's there's something to be gained by being on a more common path with the rest of the universe, right? We're, we're effectively, the, I don't know if we're the only people in the world using REST easy to communicate with GitLab, but we're, we, we very well may be the only people on the planet doing it this particular <laughs> way. And as a result, we're subject to a lot of regressions and problems that simply don't happen to other people because other people are using a more common path that we're that we're not on um, in particular the the standard way of communicating with GitLab from java is to use the um there's a there's an official or semi-official java library um i forget what it's called now but um i'll look it up uh, uh gitlab for j um so that that's a very nice library that um gives you these Java classes and you can invoke methods on them and it will figure out in the back end how to translate that Java method call into a, a JSON request for you. So that, that GitLab for J library is that's that's the common path that the rest of the universe is using to communicate with GitLab. We we've actually already bundled it as a Jenkins library plugin and it's being used by the um, GitLab branch source plugin mm -hmm. for Jenkins it's being used by the GitLab authentication plugin for Jenkins. Um, so this this is kind of the standard code path that we'd like to follow uniformly um, in in all Jenkins plugins, including the the GitLab Jenkins plugin. 
so the the idea behind this project would be to migrate callers from uh, Rest Easy to the GitLab for J library, and what that would accomplish would be that we'd be following a more standard deployment paradigm. We likely wouldn't run into all of the regressions and bugs that we encounter with Rest Easy. Um, we just encountered a new one this week, in fact. Um, so uh, that's really the project in a nutshell is bringing us into a more standard deployment pattern by eliminating the use of a very old library in favor of the more commonly used GitLab for J library. So, so the uh, Buzzle, Buzzle's comment changing from one library to another, my brain sh shows big signs that say there's probably work involved there and it's, we don't want to regress. So there's testing involved. There's familiarization with, hey, how do you use this thing? There's probably interactive exploration needed. Um, mm -hmm. Very likely that additional automated tests will need to be added in doing this because probably discover, oh, whoops, here's a piece of code that called REST easy, had no interactive or no automated tests, uh, those kinds of things, and major service to the Jenkins community doing it. Yeah, I, I, I can feel uh, that. So interesting work, useful work, and substantial work. So Yeah, Good. as it turns oh. out this week, we just, uh, we just upgraded Jersey, and Jersey broke compatibility with rest easy so i filed there's now an issue filed with jersey um to restore rest but i could tell that the person who was responding to the issue was like oh this is very interesting you're using jersey with rest easy and <laughs> i think they used the phrase very interesting and i was like yeah, that's, in the british that's, sense of the yeah, word that's, right? that's one and way say, that's one way of why the hell <laughs> Right, right. Interesting in the sense of completely dumbfounded. What were you thinking? Kind yeah, of... like why are you still why are you still doing this? <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I can envision that. But yeah, this uh this is just a it's just a thorn in our side for a long time. Um this it made sense, I assume, when this was originally developed, but it's just no longer a viable library to use. Good. Okay. Are there uh questions? Uh, from the audience about uh, this yes, project. Yes, uh, so I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, it can be a silly question, but uh, I just wanted to know what are these corner cases which should be handled uh, during this? I didn't understand those uh, authenticated proxy servers, unauthenticated proxy servers, all those corner cases which this project is talking about. Yeah, yeah, any kind of... Any kind of library that does HTTP calls is deceivingly simple because you might think, oh, well, you know, I'm just calling a REST API from an HTTP client. And that's usually very straightforward, but there's, all, there's always tricky cases that go along with HTTP clients. For example, proxy servers, a lot of uh, companies that use Jenkins, uh, require all communication to go through a proxy server. And what that means is that the HTTP client library needs to be configured to use the proxy if it's been defined by the user. Uh, so we have, a, we have a place in the Jenkins UI where you can specify a proxy server. And from there, that proxy server needs to be plumbed through into in the in each Jenkins plugin to whatever libraries are performing HTTP requests, and it's not just it's not just the presence of a proxy server. Some of these proxy servers also require authentication, um, yeah. And some of them, you know, there's also like it gets even more complicated because there's um, HTTPS proxies that have TLS certificates that need to be valid. So it it, it can it can become fairly challenging to test some of these cases okay. and, you, and you usually don't find out about it and, unless you yeah. break it and then some cust some user of Jenkins is, is like oh well I use Jenkins with a 
TLS proxy with uh, NTLM authentication, and that stopped we, working we, when I upgraded. We've been we've been there. <laughs> I know the one who invented corporate proxies should burn in hell <laughs> because it's been a nightmare. Yeah, I got a lot of gray hairs because of that, and, and Bruno lost his. Yeah, so we, <laughs> because... we we already know proactively that without any explicit testing, that would probably break. So there's a need to do explicit testing of some of these scenarios. And you can find, you know, Docker images of these proxy servers. I've I've tried a few of them. None of them are particularly great, but I've, you know, there's ways that you can set up a local proxy and test communication with it and, and such. But it's, it's it's usually an extra step of testing that would not be intuitive to someone who's just using this, um, using an HTTP client in, in the usual way. Um, it's, always, it's always an extra level of thinking and testing to support this. Okay. Nethran, did that answer your question? Yes, yeah, somewhat. Uh, I guess I'll understand it better when I start actually understanding the project in deeper way. Uh, you have other questions. Yeah, so it's related to the proposal part. Uh, so in the proposal part, how how do I uh, like elaborate the steps involved in this project? Like, uh, so like how how do I explain it? Um, there. So did you already pull uh, the proposal template? Did you look yes. at it? Yes, there are some some guidance there. So in yeah. the beginning, you expose. So you do a summary, and then you expose what is the problem that you're going to solve with that project, and then you're going okay. to describe uh, the strategy. So what you're going you're going to do, uh, and and so and this you can use whatever technique you want uh, to explain. Uh, uh, okay. some drawings, uh, some steps. So there, there are various ways and you can try them out. Uh, and you okay. submit your document and say, do people, I'm, I'm very good guinea pig for that uh, because I don't know the details of the projects. If I don't understand it quickly, uh, then uh, others will, will have uh, problems. So okay. try to explain it to, uh, try, it, it, the good way is, you have a, a friend at university or so, and you have just 20 minutes to explain to him what you're going to do. Okay. And, and just use, use that. And there is also a part where uh, you're going to explain how you're going to split your time okay. uh, uh, during the summer. So I'm going to do first that, I'm going to do that. And this will allow us to compare with other proposals and say, Okay, this person has a sensible plan, has understood the problem. And knows. Okay. Yeah, got it. S start, do a first draft. The first one is like going into cold water. It's, it's, it's uneasy, it's not, not fun, but start writing something and then you ask people for their opinion. Does it make okay. sense? Okay. Yeah. I know it's it's scary, but here we're here to help you, and and we we want you to understand, learn from the process. Yes, yeah, got it. Did you understand the problem, or are there other details? I understood what what uh, Mark and Basil explained, so I'm even tempted to start looking into it, which I shouldn't, but uh, it's. Are the yes, you would yeah. Like to know? Uh, yeah, I have understood the uh, uh, most important steps. Uh, the only part which is triggering me is uh, the testing part. Like, uh, should we like uh, do tests often uh, to make sure the process is like going well? Integration tests, unit tests, and all those stuff. Yes. So uh, believe an old man like me. And so what has not been tested will fail. So testing is important. Testing should be automatic. So 
check everything. Mark has also opinions on on that one, so I'll stop. Yeah. So Mark, Neto, your 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 in your comment to hey automated testing absolutely and run the run the automated tests run them as a way to get started watch how they behave on your system maybe run them in a debugger and watch how they how they execute certainly look at the integration tests that are in that plugin if there are and see how they operate don't forget and this is the crucial one that i tended to forget i had a bias towards test automation and i sometimes failed to do the interactive testing that would expose bugs that were very obvious to me and not valid, ob very obvious from the user interface, but not checked by automation. So it's not just automated unit tests and automated integration tests. There's also an element where the contributor here must plan to do interactive exploration and testing interactively to be sure that it's well behaved. So Mark, the uh, the plugin has integration tests that use WireMock, and WireMock is a library that effectively it it's a Bach HTTP uh, layer where mm -hmm. it expects a certain HTTP request and will provide a canned response in lieu of a real GitLab server that would be um, that would be doing real things in the in the back end. So some challenges I could foresee are the input to the to wire mock i.e. the expected requests those might change and this might change slightly when you're switching from rest easy to gitlab for j without necessarily being wrong it just might be like putting arguments in a different order or putting like new lines after each json field or, or something like that you know so the the expected uh input to the tests might change but not necessarily in a wrong way so the test might need to be updated just to adapt to that new style of input. Um, and like I said, it's all it's all mock based. So it really has no bearing on whether it's going to work in production or not. Um, like I said, I, I don't think wire mock is going to test anything to do with proxy servers or anything like that. That's all that's something that can only be tested interactively. Well, and, mm -hmm. and whoever implemented the initial definition of those mocks probably did it based on the GitLab version at that time. And GitLab has certainly evolved, right? GitLab, the plugin has existed yeah, for a thankfully, long time. Thankfully, GitLab has a pretty stable uh, version API. I'm not sure what version we're using through REST Easy, but I think it's fairly recent. Um, that, would be, that would be another thing to look into, though, is whether, I actually don't remember whether GitLab for J is using the same version of the API as what we're currently using with REST Easy. I think it's probably the same version, but they might be REST, our REST Easy logic might be using an older version, in which case, if that's true, then upgrading to GitLab for J would not only be using a more modern library, but it would also be using a more modern API endpoint. The GitLab server itself, and that could that could require the tests to be further. That would require even more updates to the tests if they're if they're mocking an older version of the API. So, as for the other project testing, understanding what we're testing, are the tests correct? Is a first important step to get. Into yeah, I tried to get. I wouldn't even bother trying to get the tests working initially. I I just go straight for testing on a real server and then because a lot of the challenges in getting the automated test suite working are going to be merely technical rather than actually going to. like fixing real bugs like um ideally your test suite is going to help you find real bugs but in this case it's going to be mostly a hindrance the test suite is going to be mostly just more code that needs to be adapted to this new library rather than a signal to whether your production code works or not, unfortunately. So, so um, I think that's safe to assume then that it's okay to delete tests if you find that it's not helping you, that there isn't any yes religious no. or, or, okay. It's, some, it's somewhat okay. I mean, but also uh, even, even when they're only mocks, they are still useful in terms of exercising the Java code. So ideally we uh -huh. wouldn't delete them unless we have, unless it's primitively difficult to adapt the mock. 
Right. Okay. Good. Nethra, do you have other questions? Yes. You seem very mm -hmm. interested about that. Go ahead. Uh, okay. So, uh, as uh, discussed before, so the, if there is any version difference between REST API and uh, the uh, GitLab 4J API, then uh, it it would take more longer than the expected. Uh, that's what they meant, right? Yeah, there would be more more mocks that need to be adapted if if the uh, if the existing mocks are using let's say GitLab API v3 or something and GitLab for okay. J is using GitLab API v4, then that would require more changes to the mocks. I mean that's a very easy question to answer. We could just go and look at it, look at the code and see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess uh, doubts are cleared. We have. Eight minutes to go. Uh, somebody who didn't speak yet is uh, Smith, if I pronounce it correctly. Do you have questions or? Uh, hi, hi everyone. No, I don't have right now. Like I, uh, I'm interested in uh, uh, exponential back of and jitter project. Uh, I started looking into it, but uh, I've not yet uh, researched a lot because I have a job simultaneously. So we've got much time. So yeah, I will pick up the pace and we'll, uh... Okay. So if you have a question or a doubt in the next four minutes or five minutes, you can't shoot. Otherwise, uh, if somebody else has question. Uh, I have another question, uh, maybe the last one. Uh, I wanted to uh, confirm the order of things that should be uh, done for the exponential back of and jitter project. First, I should uh, uh, should I work for? Uh, should I make the CLI then stress testing framework and then exponential back of and jitter in remoting and jitter in swarm plugin? Plugin should this be the uh, order of things? The challenge with that order of things is that uh, without a way to demonstrate the effectiveness of the change, it would be unlikely that it would be uh, it would be unlikely that it would be. A pull, that a pull request to remoting would be merged. Um, if it's if that pull if a pull request to remoting is adding a jitter feature that has not been demonstrated to make any difference, and it's creating new API surface area, then it would be okay. unlikely to to be merged. So, uh, I mean, it would it be well, it would be fine to merge a remoting pull request. That just uh, that just unifies the CLI with Swarm, let's say. Um, but in order in order for that to be designed, the entire CLI needs to be thought through, even if only part of it is implemented. Um, so yeah, order is very tricky with this project. I mean, ideally the ideally the best way to start would be to find a way to reproduce this scalability problem and then to kind of iterate from there to find solutions to it. And then from, from there, even if, even, if, uh, even if no code change gets accepted into remoting, just having a way to reproduce this scalability bottleneck would be a, a valuable contribution in and of itself. I, I have the same feeling, yeah. So the stress testing framework, uh should uh, do that so that uh, so i can demonstrate uh, if uh, the changes i am uh, proposing uh, will help in will help in making remoting better yeah yeah and uh, that i mean looking at uh, looking at order of operations from a dependency point of view it, it a major design and testing dependency is having a way to reproduce this problem and to see if various solutions are effective or not. And then from an implementation point of view, the first task that I, the first task from an order of operations point of view is designing a CLI that is intuitive and meets people's expectations. I would, I would not look at the swarm CLI as a good example. That's more like an example of what not to do. Um, but even, because even if only part of that CLI gets implemented, even if, even if you only implement retries and you don't do back off, you don't do jitter, it's critical to design the CLI to 
it's critical to design the, the jitter and back off parts of the CLI because those arguments could affect the naming of the arguments for the parts that you are implementing. So uh, API design has to be holistic uh, for it for an API to be intuitive. Um, so I would really start with I'll probably start with some kind of performance testing or stress testing uh, framework or methodology from a design point of view. And then from an implementation point of view, I'd start with the CLI design, even if even if only part of that design would get implemented. Yeah, all right. Good. That my question. We're three minutes from the end. Uh, if we have a short question, you, we can go ahead. Otherwise, yeah, I'm going uh, to wrap up. Go ahead, okay. Nessa. Uh, can I just get a small uh, sum up of, of like from where should I exactly start and like how should I go through the project if a guidance like can be provided? So we're talking about the GitLab improvement. Yes, yeah, GitLab uh, plugin modernization. So if I'm going to venture, venture how I would approach it, Nethra. So the improve a plugin tutorial on Jenkins.io guides on some things that you can specifically do to improve that plugin. Look through that, that through a through improve a plugin, look through that tutorial, see which of those could be applied to the GitLab plugin. If, yeah. if they've all already been applied, great. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you're talking about the uh, schedule build uh, modernization, right? which is that the tutorial? Well, so that's what's mentioned in the video, but those same techniques can be applied to any plugin and the GitLab plugin, I believe may even still have some remaining items in it that you could you could begin a modernization using those small and simple steps. Okay. There's, there's, no, real, there's no real algorithm for how to implement a project like this. You've just got to rip out the old code and put in the new version and it won't even compile right away and you have to get it to compile. It's going to be kind of frustrating. And then once it compiles, it's not going to work. You have to, then you have to get it to work. And that's not going to be, that's also going to be frustrating and will require okay. you basically debugging some library that you've never basically debugging some code that you didn't write in order to, to integrate with it. And then once after all of this frustration, you think that you might, you might be done. But then you have to deal with proxy servers and authentication and all of and, these other insane, and then you run away. insanely complicated <laughs> uh, edge cases. So I mean that, that's that's essentially how the project would go. You know, just rip out the old library. Now it won't compile at all. Uh, then you know, add the new library. Still, still not compiling. But you know, slowly convert every method call from the old library to the new and. Eventually, after doing that long enough, it'll compile, but still not work. And uh, and then, yeah, then from there, get it to actually work in production, then get the tests to work. The tests probably need to be adapted. The tests are going to be, like I said earlier, they'd be almost useless because they won't actually help you catch problems in production. They're going to be more of a liability and that they need to be updated. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's why this project is... Uh, is something that has languished for so many years or months because it's just not the most uh, it's just not the most fun thing to do. But unfortunately, software maintenance is full of tasks like this that are, are critical to the health, the long term health of and projects like Jenkins that have been around for fifteen years tend to accumulate a lot of these types of things because the longer that your software is used, the more the world around it is changing and your software needs to adapt. I, I mean. In the 1980s, you would never need to change software because the internet didn't exist. So you could just keep it on some old library forever. But you know, now, now that your software is communicating with other software on the internet, it, it's always got to evolve and adapt. And that's that's more true for 15-year-old software like Jenkins than it is for some newer projects. So it's part of the blessing and the curse of being an older and popular software project is that you end up with a lot of stuff like this that needs to be adapted over time, but it can also be a rewarding challenge. And I, I, you know, I find this kind of work rewarding myself because it, it's got a high impact on a lot of people. And yeah. it also teaches you how to be good at reading code, which is in many ways harder than writing code. And it's a valuable skill to learn. Um, you know, I've, 
I've, I've definitely uh, had a lot of benefit in my career from being able to read other people's code and understand it. And that's something you're gonna have to do a lot of in this project. So it's not all pain and laborious work. It's, there's also a lot to be learned and a lot of, uh, of valuable real world maintenance experience to be gained, so. Okay. Uh, yeah. And one more like small doubt, this GitLab plugin has like around 57,000 installs. So does it yeah. anyway affect the project? What do you mean with that? So you're go if you do a mistake that you're going to make yeah. a lot of people Basically, angry? Don't, don't, yeah. don't pass a regression. <laughs> <laughs> now here, Natara, I'm, I'm going to tell you, don't be afraid of that. It's okay. if I take the analogy of climbing a mountain, if you're if you're doing your work seriously and you don't stretch too much or, or to take unnecessary risks and people are there to help you okay it will go well so this is not something that should refrain you to tackle it okay it's okay. a steep hill mm -hmm. and there are consequences but there are also big rewards of that because okay. you're going to help a lot of people and and the coaching uh, uh in this project will just make sure like Basil stressed in saying, you need to demonstrate that there are no, so not you, but the project needs to demonstrate that there are no regressions, that it works as, as advertised. And so these are secure mm -hmm. securities that you build in. You build. But don't so, be scared okay. by the number of people. Well, Mark, go ahead. And you're, you have a safety net. The lead mentor and the other mentors will do their best to give you feedback that helps you understand if you're making a mistake. Now, I okay. I have the fear you have, and and we should learn to live with that fear because it's a good it's a good and motivating fear. We shouldn't let it par par paralyze us, but rather we admit what I'm doing matters, and it matters to fifty thousand installations, and and that is a great thing to matter to that many people. And you've got the safety net of the mentors there to help you, but but you're your own best safety net. Write tests, perform interactive <laughs> tests, check that it behaves the way you expect, use a debugger to watch it run to be sure you know what's going on. All those things are very healthy, healthy responses to the fear that you described. Yeah, okay. I mean, the first thing I would do is step through in a debugger, the whole code path through rest easy, like from when it, from when it's, making its initial high level call, you know, going into rest easy, going into GitLab, it's basically getting familiar with, with what it's doing in the old version. Yeah. And then that way, when the new version doesn't work, you can start stepping through it and you'll have in your mind a pattern of what it should be doing. And then you can debug the new version and see where it's going off the rails. Because even, even after it compiles, it's not gonna work right away. It's gonna, it's gonna need some debugging. But yeah, unfortunately, the automated tests are going to be more of a liability than a, than a help in this project. <laughs> right. Well, okay. Here, we're five minutes over budget. Um, so I'm sorry to have to interrupt uh, because it's late in the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, thank you for staying that, uh, that late. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the mentors that uh, joined the call. Uh, and for taking the time. And it was a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, for the um, uh, contributor candidates, uh, so start working on a proposal, start to put something on paper, start interacting. You need to start somewhere. And so that we can help you to, uh, to improve and, uh, and get ready. Um, ask questions on uh, on Gitter channel or better on community.jenkins.io and uh, try to be specific uh, in your questions. Uh, the, the very general questions tend to not catch attention uh, of people. So, uh, uh, well, where should I start? Uh, I want to do it, but what do I need to do? Oh no, make your homework. But I think the people here that 
that were around the table and I have done that. So good. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank you very much for your involvement. And um, don't forget, we have weekly office hours where you can join, ask your question, exchange. We'll try to have mentors uh, regularly also on the call. I'll be there. So at least I can be uh, the, uh, the relay for your questions. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank Mark. Thank you. Bye.